Welcome. I'm happy to have another chance to study with you uh, on the subject of the evidence offered in the Gospel of John so that we might believe. The evidence that's offered there shows us that Jesus made great claims about coming uh, not from the earth but from heaven, that he was the word that became flesh, that he is the Christ that the prophets talked about, that he is one that has an equal nature with God the Father, that he's going to judge the world someday, that he's going to raise the dead. There's tremendous claims that are presented in the Gospel of John that Jesus made. And John's Gospel is written to give us evidence so that we might believe those claims are true. The first uh, lesson that we looked at as far as the evidence itself is concerned was human testimony that's found in the Gospel of John. John set forth evidence and testimony from John the Baptist, and he was a man sent from God, and a man, and also one that gave testimony about Jesus and the fact that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and the one that can baptize in the Holy Spirit. He also brought forth uh, the testimony of the early disciples that came to Jesus that they believed that he was the one that Moses and the prophets had spoken of as coming, uh, that he was uh, the Christ. And we have their confession of Jesus uh, that's offered in John's gospel. We also had uh, Nicodemus that came to Jesus, a ruler of the Jews by night, and that he recognized he was a teacher that had come from God because no one could do the miracles that he did unless God was with him. He was one that was a secret disciple, believed in Jesus, and even helped anoint his body for burial. Uh, he also sets forth Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, who through her silence uh, showed that she believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that he didn't have an earthly father. And we looked at uh, the woman of Samaria and the Samaritans that they came to understand he was a prophet, the Christ, and the Savior of the world based upon uh, what they were able to witness about him. In this lesson, we want to continue with that human testimony and look at others that are offered by John. Peter, the apostle, is one that offers evidence that Jesus' claims were true. We're told that Jesus was teaching the multitude in John chapter 6, and you remember that they had come out into the wilderness uh, to listen to him. It got late in the day, and then Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes and fed 5,000 people so that they wouldn't stumble on their way home or, uh, you know, be uh, in danger in any way. And that the people, because of that great miracle, they tried to make Jesus king by force, but Jesus withdrew by, by himself in the mountains, and he sent away his disciples uh, in the boat. It was that night that he came walking on the water to the disciples, and then when he got in the boat, the boat immediately was at the shore near Capernaum, and the words that are next spoken are in the synagogue uh, at Capernaum. The people came looking for Jesus, and they were wanting to uh, have this one that could make physical bread for them. They're looking for a physical Messiah. And Jesus sets forth his teaching that uh, you should not search for this earthly bread, but that you should seek for the bread that God gives you, and that Jesus himself is the bread of life. That people need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, spiritually speaking. Uh, get their spiritual life from him, believe in him if they want to uh, be right with God. And as a result of Jesus presenting that spiritual teaching, uh, there were many in the multitude uh, because Jesus wasn't meeting their expectations of being a physical king and was saying things that spiritually uh, were discerned and were difficult to understand they began to withdraw from him. In John 6 and verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement and we cannot listen to it. So if one doesn't put faith in Jesus Christ as the messenger from God and that whatever he says must be true, 
then you're not going to be able to get the spiritual uh, lesson out of his message. You're going to be offended in the things that he says. Now, the flesh can do no good for you, Jesus pointed out. It's the spirit that gives life. And the words that Jesus spoke to them were spiritual words that had to do with spiritual life. He wasn't talking in a crude, physical way. They needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood in John 6, 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit in our life. So Jesus was speaking to the people difficult sayings that could be discerned by one that understood spiritual things that were concerned most about their soul rather than their physical flesh and existence in this material world. And there were many people that withdrew from Jesus, we're told, in 666. And as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. He wasn't the kind of Messiah they were looking for. They were looking for a physical Messiah, physical kingdom, physical blessings, and if he wasn't going to give them those things and give them this difficult spiritual teaching, they weren't going to walk with him anymore. So Jesus sifted the multitude with his teaching. He wants those of good and honest heart that are humble, that are seeking to understand God's word, that put their faith in Jesus and uh, that can discern truth. Those that um, are just interested in material things are not willing to put in the effort uh, they're going to be rejected. That's God's will. So in 667, after Jesus talked to the 12 and he sifted them, he says, Jesus therefore uh, said, therefore, to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? He's expecting them to say no, <laughs> but uh, you don't want to go away also, do you? Because of the things that I've said. And Peter spoke up and gave his testimony about how Jesus had impressed him during the time that he had known him. In 68 and 69 there in John 6, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter says, we can't go to anybody else. We know by our observation of you and listening to your teaching, that you are the one that came from God. You're the Messiah. You're the Holy One of God that we've been waiting on. And you're the one that can teach us how to have eternal life. So we're not going anywhere. So you see the conviction that is offered there, the testimony that's given by Peter. Peter was willing to stick with that, even though he momentarily failed uh, and denied the Lord on the night of Jesus' arrest. He uh, did not fall completely, but he repented and came back. And as a result of his repentance, he became a leader uh, in the church. And of course, he died giving testimony that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. The multitude are presented by John and what their opinions and their views, their testimony is concerning Jesus. It's an divided opinion the multitude had of Jesus during his earthly ministry. So it's a divided testimony that is given regarding him. They were prejudiced by their leaders to look for an earthly materialistic Christ. And uh, they had heard uh, many prejudicial things against Jesus. The, the scribes and Pharisees were jealous of their position. And they uh, had envy towards Jesus. And they spread a lot of false propaganda about Jesus. Some stumbled over his claim that he came from heaven, we're told in John chapter 6 and verse 42. And they were saying, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? So they had trouble with this idea that his origin was from heaven, that he is the word that became flesh and dwelled among us. And... Uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, you see this divided opinion about Jesus. They accepted the fact he did miracles. That was something obvious. And yet they could not, uh, many of them, accept the idea that he was the Son of God, that he had a deity, and that he came from heaven. In 7.11, the Jews, therefore, were seeking him at the feast. 
and they were saying, where is he? Where is this Jesus? Uh, the people of Jerusalem, the enemies of Christ, are looking for him. And the opinion was divided about Jesus at that feast. This is about six months before the crucifixion, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. And you can see that opinion divided in chapter 7, verse 12. And there was much grumbling among the multitude concerning him. Some were saying, he is a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he is leading the multitude astray. So there's this debate between those that are believing in Jesus and those who are resisting uh, Jesus as the Christ and his teaching. But as more evidence is given, as Jesus shows up there at the feast and begins to preach and to work, there is uh, more people that are coming to believe in him in 726. And uh, look, he is speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? The people have recognized that Jesus has boldly showed up at this feast. Even though the Jews, it says these leaders, were seeking Jesus' life. And yet, here he is preaching publicly. And because of his influence and his wisdom, uh, the rulers aren't doing anything about it. So more people come to think, well, maybe he is the Christ. Maybe the rulers are coming to understand that he is the Christ. In 731, these rulers, they want to arrest Jesus and put an end to his preaching and him gaining any more uh, converts among the people because they can see the conviction is growing. They're, they're getting reports about what the people are saying. In 731, but many of the multitude believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ shall come, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? There are those making the argument, Jesus is doing all these miracles, and we expected the Messiah to do miracles when he comes, and Jesus has done thousands of miracles. He, he Surely the Christ couldn't do any more miracles than Jesus is doing, and of course that argument is beginning to take hold with some of the people, and there's growing conviction that he is somebody special, this man from Nazareth. In 740 through 43, some of the multitude, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. So they're thinking he's that prophet like Moses that's talked about in Deuteronomy 18. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Someone all the way to see this must be the Messiah. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there arose a division in the multitude because of him. So people were saying, this has got to be somebody important. He's got to be a pro the prophet or the Christ or some great individual that God has sent. And some said, well, he can't be the Christ. He's from, Ga he's from Nazareth. Of course, they were ignorant of what the other gospels had revealed. Uh, it hadn't become known to everybody that Jesus was born at the time of the Roman census in Bethlehem and that he was indeed born in the proper place in the house of David. So at the Passover, they have then later the triumphal entry. After Lazarus had been raised from the dead, uh, Jesus then came back from Perea where he had gone away and came again uh, to Jerusalem from Bethany. And on that morning, we're told about the great reaction of the people in the city at the time of the Passover. On the next day, the great multitudes, great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. See how much influence and power Jesus signs and teaching and raising Lazarus from the dead and other signs that he did were having on the multitude there at the feast. They didn't understand everything about Jesus, certainly, but he had a dramatic impact. And the people came out, many of them, to welcome him as the coming king that they've been looking for. Well, the leaders, when they see this reaction of the people, they're even uh, more determined to have him put to death. And by 
that next Friday, after they have arrested Jesus and he doesn't resist arrest, they're able to turn a big part of the multitude against Jesus on the day of his trial and when Jesus is crucified. In chapter 19 and verse 15, they therefore cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And the multitude were persuaded to go along and cry for his death. So the multitude, when you look at their testimony in John, was confused during the ministry of Christ. They were divided. Some understood, many of them understood, he was a great person, that he did great miracles and signs, and they had teaching like they'd never heard before. Some were convicted, but others rejected him because he wasn't the type of Christ that they thought and that he allowed himself to be arrested and didn't resist. So, yet it Next, let's look at the testimony of the Jews in the book of John. John uses the Jews kind of in a peculiar uh, way in the New Testament. Of course, every apostle was a Jew. Every member of the early church up until um, the time of uh, the gospel going to the house of Cornelius in Acts 10 was either Jewish or a proselyte uh, of the Jews. And uh, so... Jew is used kind of in a special sense in the Gospel of John. By the time the Gospel of John was written, you're beyond the, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And now the, the, the Jewish uh, people, to a great extent, are hardened uh, against the Gospel and have become uh, uh, enemies of the Gospel. Uh, so John uses the term to especially talk about the authorities in his gospel, the Jewish authorities that were opposed to Jesus, those that were in the city of Jerusalem that were hostile to Jesus. And you see that uh, reflected in what the Greek lexicons uh, tell us about the meaning of the word the Jews in the book of John. So the Jews, these that were in opposition to Jesus, what's their testimony that John presents? They were puzzled by the source of his teaching. Here is a man, a carpenter's son from Galilee, and yet he stands up in the temple and teaches with great wisdom like they had not heard before. In 7.15, the Jews, therefore, were marveling, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? He didn't go to the rabbi school to learn about all of the Jewish traditions of the rabbis and to learn all about arguing uh, religious points and all of that in the school. Well, he's a simple man from the town of Nazareth, and yet he has wisdom, amazing wisdom. And they wonder, how in the world did he get such wisdom? They're divided over his teaching and his miracles that he presents. He has teaching that sounds like nobody else, and he does works and miracles that can't be denied. In chapter 10 and verses 20 and 21, and many of them were saying, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So they are very prejudiced because he doesn't follow their religious traditions. He is um, condemning a lot of their hypocrisy and practices. And so they want to reject all that he does. He does many of his signs on the Sabbath day, which flies in the face of a lot of their teaching about the Sabbath. Uh, not what the law of Moses said, but what they and their rabbis of the past had taught about it. And so they were very prejudiced. They were very unfair in their accusations, saying, oh, he's got a demon. Uh, that's why he teaches the things he does. He, he, he's a man that's lost his mind and is insane is why he says the things that he does. Uh, very inconsistent reasoning. He has great wisdom that they can't seem to be able to deal with, and yet at the same time they say he's insane. How can an insane man have such teaching and have such influence? And uh, if he's a demon that's giving him power, how come he's going about doing good 
and healing and doing things that God does. Uh, it's inconsistent reasoning. Uh, Jesus is doing good deeds, and yet they say he has a demon. The testimony, though, that we can receive from these enemies and those that are hostile to Christ is the fact that he did many signs and that he had great knowledge, and they didn't understand how. So even these enemies give us some testimony that helps support the claims that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John also presents uh, the testimony that comes from the Pharisees and the way that they reacted to Jesus. Uh, they were divided about his, uh, in their testimony too. I, I suppose the majority of the Pharisees were opposed to Jesus and hostile to him, but there were some that came to recognize the more honest ones that uh, they had a very difficulty in being able to uh, accuse him. So they, testimony, they testified like uh, the other religious leaders to his signs. But they're divided about where does this power come from? Does it come from God? If it comes from God, then God endorses him. And they didn't want to accept that because it condemned their teaching <laughs> that they had added on to the Old Testament. In 915, again, therefore, the Pharisees also were asking him how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed and I see. He had healed uh, this man born blind by anointing his eyes and telling him to go wash. And he came back seeing. How is it that he did that? How is it that you received your sight? After the raising of Lazarus from the dead, in chapter 11 and verse 47, therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. All they want to do is resist his influence. They want to make sure that the Romans aren't upset, that someone claiming to be the Christ and that people think is the Christ has come and that they're going to lose their position. Uh, the Romans appointed the high priest. They could put people uh, out of uh, uh, official positions, and they didn't want to lose their position because of Jesus. So they recognize his signs and his influence, but they want to do everything in their power to resist his influence and try to stop it. In chapter 11 and verse 48, we find out about the influence he was having on the people that the Pharisees observed. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Look, all the people are starting to believe in him because of his teaching and because of his miracles. We can't let him go on. We've got to put a stop to this because we don't want to lose our, our, our position and have the Romans destroy the nation. They confess that they are completely failing at the time of the triumphal entry in chapter 12 and verse 19. And the Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. So they are very distressed at the beginning of that final Passover week when Jesus is welcomed into town by the multitude. And they're hanging on his every word that he's teaching in the temple. And they're thinking, how in the world are we going to be able to stop this guy? And they come to the conclusion their only option is to arrest him and put him to death. And they hope to do so privately in John 11, 49 and 50. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. So their idea is, we've got to put this man to death. On another occasion, the Jewish officials sent a group of temple officers that were under their charge to go and arrest Jesus as he was teaching in John chapter 7. Uh, many people were coming to believe because of the words that he was teaching. And these officers came back to them and gave this testimony. They, they had called a special meeting of the Sanhedrin. They were expecting the officers to bring Jesus to them, and the officers didn't have him. And they asked, why didn't you bring him? 
In verse 46, the officers answered, never did a man speak the way this man speaks. They were so awed by Jesus and his presentation of truth and the way that he taught that they could not go through with the arrest. They were mesmerized by that teaching like the people were and came back and told the officials. What was the Pharisees' response? The Pharisees therefore answered them, You do not also, you you have not also been led astray, have you? They don't uh, respect these men and their views any more than they do the multitude of people that are listening to Jesus. If they don't agree with the, the leaders, then uh, they're of no account. What are you about to become his disciples too? The man born blind is offered by John. His human testimony is set forth as a very powerful thing. A simple man that was a beggar at the gates of the temple, and Jesus healed this man that people knew there. His neighbors and friends and people of Jerusalem knew that he was a blind man, and now he's healed by Jesus. Jesus came to him. He anointed his eyes uh, with, with some mud that he had made from spittle and told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and the man obeyed, and when he washed his eyes, he could see, and he came forth and people recognized him. Isn't this the blind man? And his neighbors said, yes, that's the blind man. And others say, but maybe it's somebody that looks like him. But he said, I'm the man. <laughs> it is me. And they took him and brought him to the Pharisees. And uh, he explained when they asked him how he was healed. And it was a Sabbath day on which he was healed. Uh, and he told them what happened. And they asked him his opinion about who he thought Jesus was. And they said, therefore, to the blind man again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. That's what the blind man had come to the conclusion of. If he had the power from God to open my eyes, he must be somebody authorized from God. To speak, he must be a prophet. Well, the Pharisees, after they had been willing to admit that he had been healed, they went back on that and decided, well, he hadn't been healed. When they heard that statement, they said, we, we don't believe that you've been healed. They, they wanted to hear from his parents that he was actually born blind. And so the parents were brought in and they said, this is our son and he was blind and now he sees. But they knew that uh, if they in any way confessed Jesus, or said anything positive about Jesus that they would be kicked out of the synagogue. So they kept silent and just said, we don't know how he was healed. We just know that's our son, born blind, and now he sees. And then the blind man was called to testify again. And they asked him to repeat again how it is that he was able to see. In 9, 24, and 25, so a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He therefore answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that whereas I was blind, I now see. He just answers with the facts. The fact of the matter is, I was blind, and he, has, he caused me to be able to see again. That's the facts of the case. So the Pharisees claim that they are disciples of Moses. They know where Moses came from but they don't know where Jesus came from. And the man at this point is uh, kind of exasperated with this whole trial and asking him the same thing over and over. And he can see with his simple logic and reasoning that what these learned teachers are saying is ridiculous. The man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does what does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. How does he recognize Jesus must be a righteous person? Jesus must be somebody that does the will of God. God wouldn't endorse him 
wouldn't allow him to do these miracles if he wasn't somebody that pleased God. And he did something no one in the history of the world has done. He healed a man who was born blind. It's an amazing thing that you learn scholars can't understand that he came from God. How do they know Moses came from God? Because of the miracles that, that God gave him to do. How, how should we know Jesus came from God? The blind man says. Look at the miracles that he's doing. And at this, of course, uh, the Pharisees said, well, you're just born in sin. They treat him with contempt. They cast him out of the synagogue so that uh, he's an outcast because he's confessed Jesus. Well, Jesus found him and spoke to him in chapter 9, 35 through 38. Jesus heard that he had been put out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered and said, And who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So look at the testimony that John sets forth through this blind man. The blind man uh, was one who could now see because of Jesus. So he testifies to his power and his signs. Uh, Jesus is a prophet, he'd concluded. He has to be a spokesman for God. He must be a worshiper of God, someone who pleases God. He must do God's will, and he must have come from God like Moses did. And he is worthy of worship because the man worshiped before Jesus and showed reverence for him. So the blind man's testimony is something that everyone should weigh, John says. Then there's the testimony of Martha and Mary. Jesus came uh, to these special friends of his, people who were full of opportunity. They had known Jesus throughout his ministry. They had helped us support him and he had uh, visited their home when he came to Jerusalem. And they certainly, their testimony is uh, from very intimate relationship with Jesus. And they believed that when their brother Lazarus died and they sent word that he was sick to Jesus and then Jesus was delayed in coming and Lazarus died, when Jesus did come, they, they expressed their faith in the fact that if he'd been there, he had the power to have healed Lazarus. Uh, Martha says in chapter 11, verses 23 through, uh, or verse 21, 11, 21, Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We know in verse 32 that when Mary came to Jesus, she said the same words. They must have talked together about that, that if Jesus had been here when Lazarus was sick, he could have healed him and he would not have died. And Jesus speaks to them in order to encourage Martha, he says, in 22 through 27. Even now, I know, Martha says, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. So she believes in Jesus and whatever he has to say. She believed that he would be able to heal her brother if he'd been there. And when he says that he could raise uh, Lazarus from the dead, she believed because she believes he is sent from God, that his claims about himself are true. Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room on the night uh, before his, on which he was going to be betrayed by Judas. And while he had that last supper and Judas went away to uh, tell the chief priest where he was going to be that night in Gethsemane, uh, he went on to have a long discourse with the disciples. These are men, again, that were privileged to eat the Last Supper with Jesus. They spent three and a half years in his company. They were able to closely behold all of the miraculous works that he did and to hear the magnificent teaching that he delivered. And here is their final opportunity to hear Jesus teach before his death. 
And after they heard all of the words that Jesus told them about going back to the Father and sending the Holy Spirit and all of the things that were going to unfold in the future, they confessed what they thought about Jesus in chapter 16 and verse 30. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. So people that had every opportunity to examine Jesus at close quarters, they confess that Jesus is the one that's come from God, that his claims are true. And again, they were able to hold on to that testimony and continue to promote uh, their confession that Jesus is who he claimed to be by shedding their blood all over the world, first century world. They, these apostles were put to death saying, Jesus is the one that came from God. Pilate was one that had the power of the government and power to examine Jesus to see was he really an insurrectionist trying to be a physical king and take over the kingdom. That's what he was being charged with. Pilate, as governor, gave a calm, impartial hearing of the evidence that the scribes and Pharisees, the council came and presented against Jesus that he was making himself out to be a king. And uh, after hearing the things that Jesus had to say in response, he concluded that Jesus had done nothing worthy of death. In chapter 18 and verse 38, And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But they keep insisting that he must be put to death. In chapter 19 and verse 4, and Pilate came out again after he'd had Jesus scourged to try to please them and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. He's not worthy of being put to death. But they cried out all the more and got the multitude to cry out for him to be crucified, for Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be crucified. When therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. So Pilate is presented by John as a human witness to say, Jesus had no guilt. He did not die for his own sins. He was dying for the sins of the people, not for his own sins. Finally, among the apostles, John uh, is going to bring forth Thomas. And Thomas was uh, one of the 12. Thomas was kind of a pessimist about the outcome of what the Jews were trying to do. He thought if they went down at the time uh, that Lazarus had died and Jesus was going uh, to Jerusalem again, that they were going to be put to death. In chapter 11 and verse 16, Thomas, therefore, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> so he's got the idea this is not going to turn out well. He was very impatient also when he speaks up in John chapter 14 about going to the Father and knowing the way to the Father and uh, speaking about the Father. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? <laughs> and of course the Lord patiently instructed him, pointing out, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. After the resurrection, Thomas is pictured as being very skeptical uh, in, in listening to all of the testimony that people were given about the resurrection of Christ. He wasn't with the other 11 apostles on the first day of the week when Jesus appeared to them in the upper room. So the next week, uh, Jesus is going to appear to him again. And he'd been saying that he wouldn't believe unless he saw Jesus and was able to touch him himself. In chapter 20 and verse 25 of John, the other disciples therefore were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. But then the Lord appeared to him, instructed him to put forth his hand, to see his hands and his side, and not be unbelieving, but believe. And then Thomas gives his final testimony about Jesus. Thomas answered and said to him, Lord, 
uh, said to him, my Lord and my God. Look at the impression that Jesus' resurrection had upon Thomas, who was so skeptical and doubting. He saw the evidence and he says, Jesus is the Lord, the Christ. He is the one that is my God. God, that one who has come from God. All of those uh, things that he said are true. Then, finally, uh, John sets forth himself as a human witness in his gospel. He offers uh, evidence throughout the book that the claims of Jesus are true, and he shows that these claims are sustained by many different uh, proofs. And then he gives his personal witness in chapter 19, 34, and 35, at the time that Jesus uh, was pierced by the Roman soldiers. J John was there at the cross. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. And he has seen and borne witness, and his witness is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you, may, you also may believe. So John says, I'm telling you, I was there. I saw the scriptures fulfilled. I saw water and blood come out of Jesus' side as a sign. Of course, we're saved by that blood. We're saved by the water of baptism is where we come in contact with that blood. He saw that sign. And John then gives his final words to the book in chapter 21 and verse 24, his final testimony. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So John the Apostle wrote these things. His testimony is true. The other people in the church that received the letter of John originally, they confirm that John was a truthful man and he was telling the truth in the things that he reveals in his gospel. So let's look at a summary of all the human testimony that is set forth in the gospel of John. He gives testimony from both enemies and friends about the impact that Jesus had through his signs and teaching and knowledge and influence. People confessed him as the Messiah, the theme of Moses and the prophets, the Son of God, the King of Israel, a teacher sent from God, the Savior of the world, the Holy One of God. Enemies admitted that he did these great signs and wonders and had tremendous influence over the people that had to be stopped. Never did a man speak like him, those uh, servants had said. A prophet, he's a worshiper of God. He's the Son of God, the blind man had said. Uh, women said that he could have averted the death of their brother. He was able to raise the dead. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. He came from God. Pilate found no crime in him. Thomas, after he saw the Lord, said that he was both Lord and God. And men and women of all walks of life are called upon to give their testimony to us in the book of John. John's evidence is to produce faith in Jesus Christ and salvation for all that believe. The gospel is not a biography. He sets forth information from about 20 days in the life of Christ and uses these proofs to prove his proposition that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And I conclude Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What about you? Well, in lessons to come, we'll look at further evidence that John sets forth in his gospel. God bless you and be with you.